Okay, perfect. Um, welcome back, everyone. So well back, welcome back to this Teva One Advanced Data Analysis. And today it will be the lecture four. Um, so before the start, as I mentioned from the last time, we will have a very brief summary of what we have discussed. First half, the actual me, and then the second half, the virtual me. So what have we done the last time? So where I stopped is the probability of one event. So when events could have possible different outcomes. So for example, the coin flipping uh, events. So this event, this, th th there is only one event. We could flip the coin and then there are two possible outcomes. It could be either the tail or the head lying uh, facing up. Um, when it comes to multiple events, for example, two events and everything can be a little bit more tricky. So we saw the example from the video that I show the example from a discrete event and a continuous event. So let, let me just briefly recap this idea. But before that, let me just um, very briefly uh, to tell you again, the idea of probability. So whenever we are talking about the probability, the first and the very first thing to look at is the, the nature of the data, that means is it discrete or continuous? When it is discrete, we use the term or the terminology called probability mass function to describe it. However, when the event is continuous, we use two types of probability functions uh, to describe the events. The first one is the PDF, the probability density function. And then the second one is the associated CDF, the cumulative density function. These two are in fact uh, related. If you know one, you could derive the other and then the other way around, so both ways. And when it comes to multiple events in this example here, it is a discrete two events, one is rain. So the two possible outcomes are either rain or no rain. And then the other event is being cold and Likewise, there are two possible outcomes. One is being cold, the other one is being not cold. And what we could do here is that there can be a two by two combination and each number in these four cells, in this example, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 again, and another 0 0.3. So all of the numbers inside the cells, they are the joint probability, okay? Joint probability means uh, the probability that these things happen together. For example, uh, this point one means there is a 50% probability that it will be raining and then it will be uh, cold, okay? This is the same. So 30% not rain and uh, no cold. And each of the cells, they are joint probability. And then we also look at the marginal probability. And I guess in the video, I also talk about why or how in the history, this is called the marginal probability. It is only because uh, we will look at, uh, we will write down a number here at the margin. So for example, if we sum up 0.5 and 0.1, we could write down a 0.6 here. And this 0.6 is a marginal probability, okay? Marginal probability, the literal meaning is in fact that I only care about this event and this outcome regardless of the second event, okay? So it's either rain or no rain, I don't care. I only, I'm, I am only interested in if it is cold and I'm interested only in the probability of being cold. So in this case, I sum these two numer numeric values up to get a 0.6. And similarly, if I look at, uh, if I only focus on this column, then I sum these two numbers up. I could write down a 0.4 here. This is again the margin of the table. So this is another marginal probability irrespective of the outcome of these two events. Either code or no code, I don't care. I only care about the probability of being raining here. So 0.1, 0.3, then the result is 0.4. Okay. And then the last one is a little bit tricky, I guess. So this is, um, called a conditional probability, so what that means. So conditional probability, first of all, so let's see there's a bar here. So whenever you read paper, literature, whatever, if there's a bar here, this vertical bar, this means a conditional probability. So the condition is here, the right-hand side. 
And given the right hand side, you're interested in the probability of this thing. So literally here, this means the probability of X being one, given that Y is one, okay? This is the conditional probability. So let's decouple, um, tease apart these things, how, how to read it. So if I know the condition already, that's Y, this Y uh, events equals one, that means I am here already. That also means Y is one that happens already. That is, that is already happening. It is already cold. And given it is already cold, what is the probability that the X also equals to one? So what is calculated here is in fact, you are using or we are using this 0.5 then divided by the sum of here, these two numbers. And then we get a conditional probability, okay? So conditional probability in a, in a simpler term. So what it means that is fixing one. So one is fixed or actually multiple can be fixed. But let's say if there are two events, one is fixed. And then we look at the other uh, uncertainty or variability. Okay, so this is the conditional probability. <clears throat> and uh, um, we also moved on to continuous events as usual from discrete events. Say there are two continuous events on the X axis and, and on the Y axis, doesn't matter what they mean. So there is a conditional, uh, there is a joint probability already. So this looks like a cloud. This is like a circle, sphere, cloud, however you call it. This is a joint space of two continuous events. So every dot here, so if you, uh, imagine you could draw a random sample from this sphere area or region. So every dot, if you place your cursor here, you draw a dot, each dot means the joint probability from these two events, okay? And the marginal events, again, go back to the definition. What does marginal events mean? So marginal events means, or marginal distribution means, I only look at the margin. What that means, that means regardless of the other events. In a relatively extreme example, we could imagine there are not two events anymore. Let's say there are 100, 100 events. And then you, uh, the 100 events can be called X1, X2, X3, into X99, X100, okay? There are 100 events. Let's say I am interested in the marginal distribution of X1. So what that means? So that means I do not care the events from two, from the second to the 100. I only care the events of X1. So regardless, irrespective of the distribution, the shape from the second to the last uh, of the events, I'm only interested in the, the first one. And in a simplified example here, I only have two continuous events. So here in the Y axis, this is distribution of the Y axis, irrespective of the other. And then here, similar idea. What I plot here is the marginal distribution of the X axis, irrespective of the others. In this case, irrespective of Y, but it can be more complex from the second to the last. We don't care. We only care about the one we, we care, okay? Uh, conditional, conditional distribution is, again, go, to, go back to the definition, what conditional distribution means. That means we could fix one outcome of the event and then look at how the other dimension varies or changes. So for example, each of the dotted line here, for example, this line, this means this is already the condition. So given this condition, how does the X axis, um, how is the X axis distributed? And then if we change the condition from the top one to the second top, let's say given this condition on the Y axis, how is the X axis distributed? And then similar idea goes on and forth. So this one, the last one, given this condition, how is the X axis distributed? So we're always like fix, fixing one and look at the others, okay? So those are uh, the three types of probability joints conditional and marginal distributions for both the discrete events and continu uh, continuous events, okay? Are there any questions? If you had from the last time or now, if anything is okay.
like good, I guess. No questions, perfect. So feel free to ask questions. Okay, perfect. And then, so why we took the time to discuss conditional distribution or uh, joint distribution, joint probability, marginal distribution, marginal probability, these are different terms, it's quite confusing. And sometimes you just keep track on what they mean. And why do we talk about that? So it is because they actually lay the foundation of understanding uh, the central part of our seminar, of our Teva, Teva one. So the central is the central part is the Bayes theorem. And uh, I guess most of you, even before, prior to joining the Teva, you have heard about or have seen something like Bayesian statistics, Bayesian analysis, Bayesian this, Bayesian that. It, it sounds a little bit fancy, but actually uh, the equation, even though that looks a little bit uh, complex, but if we know the under, uh, underlying idea of the different probabilities that we have been working on, conditional, marginal, joint, we could easily even derive the Bayesian equation, the Bayes theorem. So this is, this is what we've done already from the last time. So suppose that there are only two events, A and B, and let's say we are interested in here, the joint probability in the beginning, and the joint probability of A and B is apparently the joint probability of B and A, the, the order doesn't matter. Who comes first, who comes second, really doesn't matter. We just are interested in uh, when they come together, the, the joint probability, okay? And given that the idea is that we have worked out from the example using discrete events and continuous events, we could actually expand the joint probability into a product between here, one is the marginal probability, the other one is the conditional probability, okay? So why do I call P of B marginal probability? It is because I am only interested in the probability of B regardless of A. So this I could call it a marginal probability of B. I could also say irrespective of A, but this is uh, unnecessary. And then here, this term, this is clear because there's a vertical bar here. This is the probability of A given B, okay? So usually if you read all those kind of multiple products in the long equation, personally, I would always read it from the right-hand side so here that means I have a probability of B. It happens first, for example. And given that the outcome of B, B can be a zero, can be a one, can be a ring, can be a no ring, doesn't matter. So there is a prob probability of B that, that happens already or, no ha or doesn't happen, doesn't matter. There is a fixed or like a known uh, um, event, no, known outcome, no uncertainty anymore. So when this is already here, I'm interested in given that one, given B, B first, and given B is already there, either happening or not happening, I'm interested in the P of A, okay? So from the right-hand side to the left. And uh, if I could expand P of A comma B, I could do the same for P, B comma A, and then same idea, here I have probability of A and then given A is there, I'm interested in P of B. Okay, good. So what we know is that this left-hand side, these two terms, probabilities, they are the same. And then we are sure that these two here at the right-hand side, they're also the same, they're identical. So what we can do is that we can write down here, this one is the same equals to the, the, the other one. And we could just simply rearrange this equation to say, well, we want to put the P of B from the left hand, left hand side of the equation to the, from, from the left to the right hand side of the equation. So then uh, we get this famous or infamous Bayes theorem. So P of A given B equals P of B given A times P of A and then divided by P of B, okay? So this is the shape, this is the format. And then this is how it is usually uh, presented or delivered when you see like a blog article, there's a news, there's some paper. Usually they start with this one. This is like the simplest form of the, of the Bayes theorem when there are only two events. And uh, if, I, if I'm allowed, then I could say a little bit things about the Bayes theorem. So Bayes theorem or Bayes equation, it, it actually describes the relationship between a marginal distribution and a conditional distribution. So here, P of A, P and B, P of B, both of the probabilities here, 
they are marginal probabilities. And then here and here with the vertical bar, so they are conditional probabilities. So essentially the Bayes theorem describes the relationship between marginal probability and conditional probability of multiple events. Because if there is only one event, you can't really say that there is a conditional probability or marginal probability because it doesn't make sense, right? So when there are multiple events, the Bayes theorem describes the relationship between marginal probability and conditional probability. Okay, this is, that is, if you, if you forget the shape, doesn't matter, just remember that it links marginal probability and conditional probability. All right, perfect. Are there any questions? Everything's all right. Okay. So if everything's all right, then we move forward. Um, we focus on here, this base equation, there is the A and B, there's the conditional probability, and then there's the, the marginal probability, and why, why, why we use it, how this can be helpful, and why so many people are so interested and so excited about it. So what is the reason about that? Um, so then it will become the focus of today's topic or today's lecture. So we, are, we will be talking about linking data and parameters. So what that means. So let's say, well, we have the A and B here again, A and B, we have seen it. The A and B, what are they? They are the arbitrary. So A can be rain versus no rain. B can be cold versus not cold. It, it can be something else. It can be that if I have had lunch or not, and if I had uh, studied data camp, for example, yes or no. So those, those are arbitrary. So A and B, they can be anything. And uh, if they can indeed be anything, and it is indeed arbitrary, so why not we replace A and B with something called theta and data? Okay, theta and B, capital D. So here, if we do that, it will become something like this shape. So we know that, okay, here it appears like the P of theta given data equals the P of data given theta multiplied with P of theta and divided by P of data. So here, capital D means uh, data. And what does that mean? If I say this is a theta, this is a data, what does that mean? And this, you can actually relate to what you have known or to what we have been familiar with. It is we are interested in some psychological phenomenon. And if we are interested in a research question, we design a task, we design an experiment and we test our hypothesis. So this is what we do. And uh, when we have a hypothesis and we design the task, the next thing we do obviously is to run the experiment. And after maybe two or three months data collection, we have data. And then the data here is like the D here, the capital D. This is the data we have given some hypothesis that we are interested in, okay? And uh, when we have the data, the next step is perhaps, well, analyze the data and using some type of statistical analysis. If we have a between subject design, we are perhaps interested in the group differences between one control, one um, placebo or experimental manipulation. And if it is a within subject design, something like a training task, the participants they come into the lab twice, uh, they do the same task also twice, but in between the two tasks, pre and post, pre-training and post-training, there is a, I already, tell you, I already told you, there's a training in between. So we are perhaps interested in what, the, what does the training do to the participants? If the performance of the post-training better or worse, or usually better. So if the performance of the second one better than the baseline, that is the one uh, pre-training. So we are interested in within the same person within participants, study design, what are the changes, okay? So those are already two types of analysis. One is the uh, independent sample t-test. The other one is the paired t-test, okay? And uh, uh, believe me or not, if you are running the t-test already, you are already doing parameter estimate. So the obvious idea is perhaps 
you, cal you will calculate the T value and the P value and the associated degrees of freedom of the task. So I'm not sure how you learned a T test, the simple T test. And when I learned that I have a textbook and at the very back, I have a, like a search lookup table and I have the sample size and I go to the table to see according to the current sample size, what is the degrees of freedom? And according to these degrees of freedom, what is the critical P value, right? What is the P value of, of being uh, significant? And then I compare if that is significant or not. So this is the T and the associated T P and the degrees of freedom. So this is already um, a parameter estimate. And T test and Getting more complex can be ANOVA, can be a regression model. So if this is a regression analysis, we could have the slope of the line. We could have the intercepts of the line. So what are they? They are, they are basically parameters. They are the unknown parameters that we are interested in. Okay, so to simplify what I've, what I've been talking uh, for five minutes. So we have data, we know it, and we have unknown parameter, we do not know it. So here, those are the ideas. So theta is, the unknown parameter we are interested in. Here the D, the capital D is the data. The data is that we collect it, we have it at hand. Okay, good. And then here, what these things mean, uh, you could make it a little bit more informative. So instead of calling that P of theta given capital D, we could say, well, we look at here is the probability of unknown parameters given the data we have. So does it make sense? I guess it's yes, right? Because there's the data, there's something unknown. And given the data, how does the data, how, uh, how, how does the parameter look like? So given the data, how does unknown look like? Can the unknown become known already? So this is like, actually it makes sense, a lot of sense. And in fact, in the, in the literature of, of statistics, so all of the four terms, they, they have names. So for example, let's just start from um, the left hand side, the red color. This is something I already told you. So um, the probability of parameters and not parameters given the data. And then in the literature, they are called posterior. So posterior means afterwards. So how, what does it mean? That means how plausible is our parameter given the observed data after the data? So post the data collection, after the data collection. Usually this is the, um, the target that we are interested in. So if we are doing parameter estimation, we are in fact going to find what are the posterior distributions of the parameters given the data that we collected from the experiments. And uh, um, as opposed to posterior, there must be something called prior. Prior means pre and before, right? So here prior, this thing, the yellow color, P of theta, it is the prior. So prior here, it is in fact a marginal probability of the parameters irrespective of anything. So there can be like two events. Data is there, data is not there. I don't care, I just care about what I know before data collection. So this is called um, prior or uh, how plausible is our parameter before observing the data. What our prior knowledge is even before running the experiments, okay? And uh, we have this blue color, the blue color Blue color is a little bit tricky to, to, to explain. So it is called the P of data given the theta, okay? P of data given the parameter. So literally that means the probability of data given some parameters, okay? In the literature, this is called the likelihood. So it is called how plausible is the data given our parameter is true. So this here is basically means we already have some assumptions of the parameters and given that we know some parameters is more possible, is more true in a sense. And then given that is true, how plausible our data is. Okay, we will go into a little bit more detail, but now just bear with me. Let's say this is P of D given theta. This is the, like the inverse from here, right? The theta and the D, they are like the, the inverse order, okay? And then the last one is the P of D, and uh, this is the green color. Usually in the literature, you see this is, uh, uh, this is called uh, evidence. So how plausible is the data under all the possible parameters? So if you recall from these um, hair color and 
nose eye color example, the, uh, the, the exercise from before. So the last one, so this is like the, the marginal probability of the data irrespective of the parameter. In other words, it means we have to consider all the possible outcomes of the parameter values. Parameter in that case, just colors, different colors, okay? And uh, are, there, are there any questions before I go to the details? Detail means I will explain each of the term individually. Yeah, there's a question in the chat. Is likelihood of one, is what do we need around? I, Katya, could you speak loud? I don't understand. I don't think if I understand your question. Uh, you said that uh, the prob uh, probability to. of the, do you hear me? Hello? Hello. Are you talking? Yeah. No, I don't hear. And yeah. now also not? What's wrong with my laptop, I guess? Now you don't hear Wait me. A second. <sighs> Hello, try. do you hear? Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now, no? Yes, yes, now no. I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say, you, you said the likelihood that uh, prob likelihood is the probability of the data given our parameter. So if our parameter is completely correct, then the probability mm -hmm. must be one. So it's the best case. This I wanted to ask whether it's the best case scenario where we say, mm -hmm. okay, our parameters are true. Mm -hmm. So the probability mm -hmm. of the data is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is uh, not so accurate. <laughs> I will explain. <laughs> oh. Okay, yes, please. Because I, it's my assumption, probably it's not correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Okay, good. I will just keep my headphones on. Um, are there any other questions? Good. All right. Okay, so now we just simply go to the details. And the first of all is simply the most confusing part, which is the likelihood, okay? So the likelihood, uh, it appears in the format that it is P of data given theta, okay? It appears like this. However, in the literature, it is often written in this way. So L means likelihood, and theta is theta, and then D is the, the data, okay? So why am I doing this way? So let, let me try to explain first, and then I will give, give it by, by example, and then to see if that makes sense. Um, so if we run an experiment, we have the data. What that means? That means the data is fixed Right? The data is fixed, data is already collected. Let's say we collect data from 20 healthy participants, 18 to 35 years old, um, they're there, okay? So the data is there, the data is already fixed, okay? So if the data is fixed, so that basically means we cannot change anything. And then let's talk about the theta. So the theta is something unknown. We don't even know what the theta is. We have no idea what the theta is. Okay, so now we know our, our, our setup, our beginning. The beginning is we know the data fixed, no change. We don't know the theta, it can be anything. There is that, but we are interested in the theta. Okay, this is the setup. And uh, let's see, just long, only look at here, the P of the given the theta. Let's say if we are trying to interpret this terminology, this term of probability using the definition of conditional probability, what that means. So that means given the theta, what's the probability of data? And then what that also means is this is already fixed and then we are interested in this unknown thing, the data. And then here we have a conflict. The conflict is that we have the data already, this is fixed, but from the definition, this has to be fixed, the theta has to be fixed and then varying the data. Do, do you see the difference now? Let me try to explain again. We have two things, data and theta. Data is fixed already, no change. Theta is unknown, but we are interested in. This is what we have, the setup, the beginning. However, if we want to go to the definition of being a 
conditional probability, that tells us that, uh, that the theta has to be fixed. Only when this is fixed, we can call it a conditional probability, and we go to see how the probability of different data look like. But we don't have different data. We only have a fixed data. So this is a, a conflict. It cannot be resolved. So uh, then people came up with this alternative terminology, say L, L likelihood again. So they replace or reverse the order. Theta is now on the left-hand side relative to the bar, and then the data is at the right. So here that makes much better sense because the data is indeed fixed and we are interested in something given the data. Something here is the theta, the unknown parameter. So we are interested in the likelihood of the parameters given the data. So this makes much better sense, okay? Great. And uh, let's look at my example. And uh, so what I'm trying to tell in the next, so what you will be expecting is that you will see a illustration, like kind of a, a demonstration example to show you that likelihood is not probability. So why we are talking about that? Because that's important. So in language, when we, when we are describing things, we could say something is probably happening, something is possibly happening, something is very likely to be happening. It's the same idea, right? The same thing in language, in, in normal like daily language. But in statistics, probability and likelihood, they, they have completely different meaning. So I will use this, this example to explain you why likelihood and probability, they mean different things. Well, I, I, if I say completely different, this is a little bit so uh, uh, exaggerated because they are actually connected, they're linked. And I will show you an example. Now uh, you can see it, okay? Perfect. So um, before I go to the example, uh, I, I actually have to emphasize that if we do statistical modeling, if we want to run analysis, if we want to go to cognitive modeling, um, modeling, then this is also a term that you're not so familiar with. You might just ask, you might just wonder, what, what do I model? What, what, what does it mean? What, what does it mean to, to model something? So what does it mean to model something? And the actual process to model something is in fact to construct a proper likelihood function to connect the data, which is known, and the parameter, which is unknown, okay? I repeat myself. So the process of model something can be anything. So the process of model something is to construct a proper likelihood function that tries to connect the known data that you collected and the unknown parameter that you are interested in. Okay, we will repeatedly see this idea of likelihood is in fact already the model. So this is how I call uh, the likelihood is the model because this is the central part of model something because modeling something means trying to find the proper likelihood function. In fact, uh, this is in the, the most challenging part of the entire modeling process, okay? The likelihood is the model. This is the simple message I'm trying to say now, perfect. And if I go next, why I can't go? Yes, good. Uh, this is explained. The data is fixed. The parameter varies. We don't know. It's uh, um, unknown, we are, but we're interested in. This is the setup. And uh, I am using, I will be using the example to show you why likelihood is not a probability or a probability function, okay? So let's look at here this table. Let's say it again, we have uh, the coin flipping example. And then let's say we only have two coins. And then if you flip up the coin and you get three possible outcomes. So if you have the coin, you do it twice. There are only three possible outcomes. One is two types of head facing up. The other is uh, two types of, two times of tail facing up, okay? Two heads, two tail. And then the third one is one head, one tail, okay? So those, if we if we throw um, the coin up in the air and then we catch it, there are only these three possible outcomes. 
two heads, two tails, one tail, one head. So those are the three outcomes. So let's denote this as 0, 1, 2. Let's say the number of heads is x. It can be 0, no heads. It can be 1 times of heads, 1 head, 1 tail. It can be 2 times of head. Okay. So those are the possible outcomes of the events. Perfect. And then let's assume something else. So let's assume that, well, we have not one coin, we have multiple coins. We have six coins here, each row, each line here. And assuming that we are the, uh, we are the workers, we are the workers from, from, from the mint. So we, we, we created those six of coins, for example. For example, we can do it and we design those coins a little bit differently. So the first coin, it has a zero probability lending has up, what that means. So that means if we throw it once, twice, 1,000 times, it will never show a head because it has zero probability heads facing up. Again, remind ourselves, those are the numbers that we know. We are the designer, the creators of the coin. The first coin, zero probability of heads facing up. And then the second one, similar idea, instead of being zero, now it has 20% of heads facing up means if we do, if we throw the, the coin into the air for 1,000 times, on average, 20% of the time, we will see a, a head, and 80% of the time, we will see a tail, okay? Similar idea, we can change this number from 0.2 to 0.6, uh, 0.4 and 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and 1, okay? So those are the numbers that we know it. And uh, let's say, again, those coins are from our creation. We know how it works. Okay. And then let's look at only one line here. Let's only look at one line here. So suppose that we know those number and we know this 0, 1, 2. What we are about to do now is, even though that's already here inside, what we are about to do now is to write down each number inside of the cells. Okay. So because this one has a zero probability and we know that there will be a one uh, probability, probability of being one to receive twice of zeros, no probability of one and no probability of two because it's never possible to receive heads facing up for this first coin, okay? Likewise, we can go to here. This is another extreme. So usually if you look at something, you could, if there's a range, so go to the two ends, go to the two range, go to the two ends uh, of the range and then to see the extreme behavior first to see the extreme behavior and then to see what happens in the middle. So here, this is what I do. Um, there is the probability of one. So instead of one, zero, zero, I can just write down zero, zero, one. This is the opposite, it's entirely the opposite. Okay. <clears throat> and then I can fill in the numbers of the second line. So here, this is the probability of facing up for one coin flipping 20%. If I am getting twice of the heads facing up. So what's the probability? So one time is 20%, okay, here. And I do it twice. So that means 0.2 multiply with 0.2. So here, right? So it's 0.04. So this is the, the similar idea, it's the opposite. So 0.8 multiply with 0.8, so it's 0.64. And in the middle, you can say, well, one minus that, one minus that, you get, you get the, the remaining. So one head, one tail. And with the similar idea, we could fill in all those numbers inside, inside, of, the, inside of the table. Okay, good. So now we know it. And uh, next, what do we do? So we, do, we, we, we could focus on here, this column, this column. So when this, pro, uh, the, uh, uh, when this parameter this is the unknown parameter already in this case even though we know but let's say this is not this is known now instead of an unknown parameter this is a known parameter let's focus on this line so when the probability is zero and we get the associated probability for these three events one zero zero and if we sum up these three values it is one okay good this is when the coin, the probability of heads facing up is 0.2. And then we again calculated all those 
three numbers. And then if we sum them up, we get a one, okay? And then if we do the same thing for all those remaining lines, we sum all those lines up and, do, and do, those here, we get a one, okay? Good. And so to make it a little bit more abstract, what that means, so that means when the probability here, when the theta, when the parameter is fixed here, given the parameter is fixed, what is the probability of zero times facing up? What is the probability of one times heads facing up? What is the probability of two times of heads facing up? Okay, when the theta is fixed, the data is varying, we want to calculate the probability and we could. And if we take the sum, they sum up to one. And this in fact uh, satisfies one of the criteria of BM probability because we talk about probability um, if we would consider all of the possible outcomes of one event, the probability must sum up to one. Otherwise, it, it, it is not a probability, okay? So we do the calculation, sum up. Second line, we got a one again. We sum up here those three values and then we get a one, one more time. This is great, just we know it, perfect. And so now instead of looking at each row, we could look at each column. So this is the other scenario that we will have. So the other scenario is that instead of being the creator of the coin, we got a coin randomly from a stranger on the street and uh, we flip it twice and then we get the outcome. And then we could estimate what is the probability of facing uh, uh, from the coin uh, of facing up. So we are interested in the unknown theta in the case, like in the idea of we have the experimental data, we want to do the t-test. We have no idea and we have, we can do the statistics, we can do the test. So this is the more um, realistic scenario. So we have the data already, but we know nothing about the parameter. Okay, good, let's focus on here. So let's say I got a coin from a random person in the street and then I had the coin flipping twice. I get zero heads facing up, so two tails. And um, there is a likelihood function. So the likelihood function is the binomial distribution. So I guess from the last time you have seen from the exercise, there's a binomial distribution in this case, good. So according to that binomial distribution, we could calculate uh, each numbers here. But actually this number is already here that we filled in from the, uh, from the first example or first scenario. When we know here, we are interested in, interested in these three numbers. So what we do next is we sum up here, those numbers, okay? And we get a interesting value, 2.2. And then if we sum up here, these numbers, and uh, we get 1.6. Here we sum up this column, we get 2.2, okay? So whatever that means, 1.2 or 2.6 uh, or 2.2 is meaningless in the sense that they can be anything. It's, but what it's not um, show is that it's, it's, it's nearly never a one. So it's possible that for some other uh, example, we have the column summing up, this can be one, but this is like by chance. Usually if you sum up all those numbers, this value is summing up, this marginal value is, is not one. Okay, so let's move back to the zoom out to the bigger picture. So why am I talking, why am I telling you here, this is not one, this is obvious, 2.2 is never one. So what that means? That means um, when we are summing up those numbers, we are already in the situation where the data is fixed yet the parameters is changing, is varying. So the data is fixed. We have twice of the coin flipping, two times of tails. And we are interested in, well, what is the likelihood of the parameter being zero, the parameter of being two, the parameter of being 0 0.4, the parameter of being 6, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1.0, okay? We're interested in the likelihood of the parameters given the data. So we are entering this scenario. And uh, when we are summing up those numbers, we are summing up the likelihood of all the possible parameters given the fixed data. 
And this sum summary summation is not fun, which in fact violates the assumption of being probability. In other words, that means it is not a probability. Okay, does that make sense? I guess I spent way more, way much more time on this likelihood because this is necessary and important. So simple message is likelihood is not probability. Likelihood is not probability. This is the take home, the only take home message you have to you have to get today. Likelihood is not probability. Okay, enough. And then if somebody asks you, can you verify that likelihood is not probability? Well, show them show them this table and then show them this number and also show them this number. So this number verifies being probability when the, pro when the parameter is fixed, but data is varying. However, if you focus on the column, when the data is fixed, but the parameter is varying, this is not a probability. And then the researchers have to give a name, right? Then the name is called likelihood. Good. I guess we could move on. But before that, any questions? That sounds good. Yeah, there's a question to ask. Is 2.2 already the likelihood? Uh, yes, it is the, the sum of the likelihoods. Yeah. So each of the numbers here, 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 here. If you say this, when this is fixed, this 1.0 is already the likelihood of parameter being zero, given the data is also zero. And this is likelihood of that. And then this number is the likelihood of parameter being 0.2 given the data is zero, okay? And then the same number could mean probability, but well, this is the confusing part, I guess. So this parameter, uh, this number can mean the probability of receiving zero times highest facing up, given the parameter is prime two. So now I guess you see my, 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 uh, my, my reasoning. So the likelihood and the probability, they indeed mean different things, but they are actually two sides of the same coin. So we are looking at the same thing from different perspective. So the numbers, they are the numbers, right? The numbers, that, 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 they are the numbers. We are using the numbers from the beginning to the end of the example. They are the same numbers. If we sum up across the row, it's okay, probability. If we sum up across the column, they're not probability, but the numbers, they are the same number. So in other words, what we are trying to say is, well, this is basically a, margin, uh, a, a conditional thing. So what is fixed and what is changing? So this is the, uh, the trickier part. Good. All right. So if no more questions, we could move forward. Yeah. And I will share the slides today. And then there's a video. It is very good. I guess he explains the difference between probability and the likelihood even better than I do. So I really highly suggest you watching this video. And in fact, I also highly suggest following this account. And he um, really frequently shares contents illustrations, explanations of statistical facts and uh, types of analysis from simple to complex. It is very good. Perfect. So after talking about the likelihood, already the, the most complex part from today's lecture, so we will move to something a little bit simpler. So what is the probability uh, P of theta? So P of theta recall on the equation, different colors, that means the prior, prior as the name suggests, it is the probability of the parameter before we have seen the data. So the prior knowledge, what our prior belief is. 
um, it can be arbitrary, but there are different types of priors from the literature. So uh, in the literature, usually you could see three categories of priors. So one is called a uniform prior, the other one is called weekly informative prior, and then the third is not shown on the graph, it's called informative prior. Okay, what that means. So in this example, it doesn't matter the x-axis and the y-axis, doesn't matter the number. So it doesn't matter the, the label. Let's only look at the numbers. So from zero to, to 120, okay? So uh, this uniform prior or uninformative prior in the literature, that means all those events, so all those numbers from zero, one, two, three, four, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, they have the same probability. So there is a single line here. This is called a uniform distribution already, so hence the name, uniform prior. Uniform, uniform prior basically says nothing, so everything is equally likely, and uh, we don't have a stronger information or prior knowledge of one parameter value than the others. We don't have this distinction if we have a uniform prior distribution, okay? And instead of being so vague, we could be a little bit more informative about our prior knowledge. So for example, I, for some reason, from the literature, from supervisor, from sources, news, blog post, I know that the number around 20 is more likely than the others. So our prior knowledge can be that, okay, I have a relatively higher confidence to say that, well, the number is here, and then the numbers below and here after, they, they have a, a relatively lower uh, probability, okay? Good, so this is the weekly informative. And why it's called weekly informative is because there's a peak, there's a distribution. The peak is the informative part. So it is informative, but not so strong, it is weak. So weak is quantified by the width. It's like a standard deviation. It's like uh, if this is wide, very wide, then we have a very weak informative prior. It can be informative, but just weak. On the opposite side, if we have a strong or very informative prior, what you can imagine is that, again, let's say we focus on 20, it's basically a very tall distribution and narrow, right? Narrow. If, if it is narrow, then that also means we are quite precise about the knowledge of uh, 20, so 20 is something we know and we know for sure, very sure, and it's narrow, then we have an informative prior. Okay, good. So the three types of prior. Weakly, informative, strongly informative, and then here, uninformative or uniform distribution. And then perhaps you have another question. The question now is you want to do statistics you want to do statistical analysis, you know choosing prior might even change your results and how to decide on the prior distribution. So let's leave this question later, even later for the, uh, the, the second part of the seminar, but keep this question. Prior choice can be tricky, but there are ways to get around it, okay? There's a question from the chat window from Anna and she asks, how would you interpret the one in the table as a likelihood? First field and table in previous slides. Okay, let's just go back to the previous slides. Okay. Does it mean is a kind of pretty sure that the coin has zero probability for has? So if likelihood doesn't sum up to one, how do we interpret the size? Yeah, good question. So if I focus on here, this row, when I fix the parameter value, when the theta is fixed and then the data is varying, these numbers are interpreted as probability. So here means probability, 100 probability given this parameter, I receive zero has, and zero probability here and here, I receive one or twice, once or twice of has based on that, okay? If I do this. And then on the other hand, if I focus on the column, when the data is fixed, the one is already here, what that means. So that is the likelihood of parameter being zero given data is zero. 
and how do you interpret it? It's the similar idea when we describe the y-axis of the PDF of distribution. It can be interpreted as a relative probability, but it's not a probability. High and low, it makes sense. So one is higher than 0.64. It makes sense. It, indeed, it makes sense. This is larger than that. But how does really this exact magnitude making sense, make sense? This is difficult to say because this is relative. Okay. Yeah, cool. Glad to hear that makes sense to you. Then there's another one from Katya as long we don't have other data 0, 0 0.0 is likely to be true parameter uh yes yes so if we have a very limited sample let's say we only allowed we are only allowed to throw the coin twice and only twice and then if we get um zero only okay zero twice, twice zero. And then we ask ourselves, how likely is the probability facing up, facing up of the coin that I received randomly from a person? In this case, you will say zero, because if you say, if you throw and catch, throw and catch twice, you receive zero and you might, you might just imagine that, well, perhaps the coin just only has a probability of zero facing up. Yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, great. Great question. And then if you throw the coin many more times, three, four, five, and then you might just um, change your thinking or update your ideas about how the coin might look like. Make sense, everyone? All right, great. Good. The prior and then the P of data. And the last one. And uh, the probability of the data, it, it appears at the denominator of the equation in green, in this green color. And uh, I'm talking about the P of data in two types of events. So one is the discrete events, the other one is the continuous event. Okay. So in the color, hair color and uh, um, uh, what's that one? The, uh, the eye color example. So we actually calculated this denominator and then this is basically a sum up and uh, this is a marginal distribution. It's look at one event irrespective of the other. So it's basically appears like this. And uh, when you have a continuous event, we cannot do a sum up anymore. So what we can do instead is that we calculate the integral and then we get the P of data, okay? This is this sounds quite um, boring or difficult, dry to understand. So what, 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 what am I talking about that? Well, I actually don't want to talk about it. So in the um, exercise later, you will see that the P of data, which is which appears at the de denominator of the equation, which is basically needless. We don't need it. And it's quite complex to calculate as shown here. For one, it's, calculate, it's complex to calculate. For two, even though we can calculate, it doesn't really make any difference. So we are not really interested in P of data, okay? So, uh, just for completeness, I show the slides, but later in the exercise, I will show you how needless the denominator can be. So don't worry if you uh, see this is too much. <clears throat> okay, great. And uh, we have seen, we, so let, let, me, let me go back to the beginning. So what do we have done today? We have the base theorem. We have two events A and B. So we have the P of A given B equals P of B given A multiplied P of A and then divided by P of B. So this is like the arbitrary, the base theorem, A and B. So what we done today is that we replace the A and B because they're arbitrary. We replace A and B with data and theta. Data is the experimental data that we collected to test our hypothesis, for example. And then the theta is the unknown parameter that we are interested in given the model that we want to. 
Okay. And all of the four parts, they have names. The left-hand side, the very left-hand side, PR fit a given data, that's the posterior we will be interested in eventually. So given the data, what's the parameters look like, how they are distributed posterior after the data is collected. Uh, conversely, we have the prior, the PR theta before data collection. What's our prior knowledge is about the parameters. And then this conver um, a controversial idea of likelihood. Likelihood is not probability, very important. Likelihood is not probability. It appears as P of data given theta, but it is in fact a function of changing parameter theta given the data is fixed, okay, likelihood L. And then lastly, we talk about P of data, is, which is first calculates, calculation is complex, second needless to calculate. So I show you there, but don't have to worry about that. Okay, that's the basic equation we have for now. Posterior, prior, likelihood. If we remember all of the three terms, that's already enough for today. <clears throat> Next, why, why, why we are talking about this? Why, why we are doing this? Why we are talking about the Bayes theorem? So why the Bayes theorem is important? Um, to illustrate this idea, so let's say, well, we have a cause and we have some effect. So the cause is in fact the theta and then the effect is something we can observe the data. So linking back to the coin example, the cause is that if we know that we are the creators of the coin, we know the cause and then we could expect how likely, how probable, <laughs> how probable each event is, which outcome is given the event, okay? So we know if we know, if we, if we know if we are very sure about the parameters of the coin, if we, are, if we have created those coins, we know this. And from another perspective, it's like there's some kind of reasons or causes that lead to some data we could potentially observe. So what, what is that? This actually description is an uh, experiment. We have some cause and then we have effect that we could observe. And uh, what we do when we actually collect the data, what we do is that we use the data, we use the data and then we analyze the data. We do statistical inference and then we want to infer what might be the cause, right? Do you see the link? So here there's experiment and then here is the uh, statistical inference. And what we do is nearly every day is statistical inference. And uh, here this slide shows you why Bayes theorem is, theorem is important. So how it is important can be reflected here. So the, given the data, we inferred, we inferred the cause. This is actually the posterior, right? Given the data we observe here after the bar, we are interested in how likely each cause is. So what is the posterior distribution? of the parameter after the data is collected. This is the inference and then this is the posterior. And this is why uh, the Bayes theorem in data analysis is, is extremely important. Okay, good. So then there's a guy and he once mentioned that probability is orderly opinion and inference from data is nothing other than the revision of such opinion in the light of relevant new information. <clears throat> okay, so we have the data, we want to infer what might be the cause, so then that's the posterior distribution of some parameters that we might be interested in. Okay, <clears throat> let me summarize a few things that we have mentioned today. So first of all, there is the debate theorem and we re replace A and B to theta and data, I don't want to repeat. And second of all, probability and likelihood, they are different things. In fact, they are two sides of the same thing. So they are from different perspective, but the actual idea is the same. And then the third uh, message that you might want to take home is that how to explain likelihood to people. If some people ask you, hey, I heard, heard that you are taking a Teva and uh, what did you learn today? And you say, well, I learned something called likelihood. And then the other people will say, mm, great. So explain to me what likelihood is. And then the explanation is that the likelihood is actually the model of 
the entire statistical model process. And then you could also say, well, when we are doing modeling, what we are modeling, what we are trying to model is basically to find the appropriate likelihood function that tries to link the known data that we collect and the unknown data that we are interested in. Okay, so this is perhaps a little bit tricky to memorize, but this is the central idea. Likelihood is the model. Good. Any questions? Good. Can I repeat the sentence just one more time? One more time. Which sentence? Uh, modeling. Oh yeah. yeah okay. Um, so, what we are trying to model. So, what does modeling mean? The entire process of modeling something is to try is try to find the appropriate likelihood function that links the known data and the unknown parameter. Or simply put, likelihood links data and parameter. I guess this is simpler, right? So you try to find the appropriate likelihood and then connects or associates data which is known and parameter which is unknown. And this thing, this process of trying to find the appropriate likelihood function linking data and the parameter, this, this process is called modeling. <clears throat> is that better? Makes better sense? Okay, great, perfect. Any other questions, comments? Everything's all right. Yeah, okay. Um, we only have, how much time do I have? We started at three, right? Ah, still 20 minutes, sorry. Um, okay, so when we know the roughly vague idea of how to link modern data. And the next thing that we ask ourselves is perhaps, I want to see my example. I want to see in a real concrete example, detailed example, how data can be linked to parameters under a specific type of likelihood function. In other words, we want to model some real data, okay? And then let's see, move to the second section of today's lecture. So I will use a binomial model, binomial function, to model some data. Great. Uh, for example, you're curious about how much of the surface is covered in water, uh, the, the globe, the earth. So you are interested in this question. You're very curious about the geological question. And uh, what you do is that, well, you cannot really travel to the world entirely to measure the proportion of water versus not water, which is land. This is difficult. So this is a big, big word, okay? Instead, if you cannot manipulate the big word, what you can do is that you can manipulate the small word, which is you can, you can go to a store and buy a globe. So then you have a globe, and the globe, let's assume that the shape and every uh, segmentation is really precisely matching the actual phase and uh, land and land and water of the of the uh, of the earth. So let's say this is a precise globe. So instead of manipulating the big world, you can manipulate the small world. And what do you do? So it's similar idea of uh, tossing the coin up in the air, you could just throw or toss the globe also up in the air and then catch it. And you record whether or not the surface under your right index finger is water or land. So catch and uh, throw and catch and then record. Throw, catch, record, throw, catch, record many, many times. So every time just under your right index finger, water is uh, denoted as W, land is denoted as capital L, okay, L and W. Let's say you do this experiment many times, let's say nine times, and then you observe a sequence. So first time a water and the land, W, 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 L, W, L, and W. So those are the nine times of experiment. You can imagine this is like the coin flipping example, head, tail, head, tail, head, head, tail, tail, something like that, nine times. 
and then you get the events, uh, the, the outcome, okay? Uh, so quite straightforwardly, you can just calculate the proportion. The question is, is this a okay calculation? So out of the nine times of throwing, catching, throwing, catching, we get six times of water um, observation. So we do six over nine, is it, is it okay or not? So this is the question, okay? Uh, if we do six over nine, what we are doing is in fact already frequency analysis because we are calculating the frequency. And what we are doing now is we could argue that this analysis can be done in a different perspective, which is the Bayesian perspective. Let's see how this works. So before we go to actually model something to find the proper or appropriate likelihood function linking data and model, let's see what are the, what are the possible steps of modeling, modeling something. Um, the first very important part is to find out what can be the possible data story. The data story is like, think about how the data might arise, how the data might be generated. So it can be descriptive or even causal, okay? So descriptive is something like in the, in the, in the, earlier, in the earlier ages of psychology, uh, the psychologists, they, they observe something and then they only verbally describe a theory. And then this is not so, um, Quantitative is okay. So uh, this can be verbally, orally described, can also be uh, quantitatively described both ways. But this is only the beginning. You have a data story. What might be the theory? Second, you update this idea. You update this data story. You update, uh, uh, the, uh, you update after the data observation. So the idea is to educate, educate your model by feeding it with data. And then this follows the Bayes rule, the Bayes update rule. So that's why or how we can use the Bayes theorem when we are doing analysis. So we have the prior, we have the likelihood, we have the posterior. So in th essentially that means we will update our prior knowledge, given the data and get the posterior. When we get one outcome of the event. And then we, when we observe another data, we observe, we will update again from prior to posterior. And when we have a new data point, we do the same thing from prior to posterior until we see, until we could calculate the posterior given all the data points that we could possibly collect, okay? And then the lastly is to evaluate. And then after uh, data collection, after the model fitting, we could see if the model is if the model has the power to explain the data. So compare model with reality, compare what you have, what you hypothesize with the actual data. If it works pretty well, great. If it doesn't work, change your model. Change your model, what that means, change your data story, change your likelihood function. This could go back. <clears throat> okay. And then there will be a graph like this. You will see this, in fact, many, many times throughout the entire lecture. So I will start from here. Uh, say we are focusing on here for now. So we have some data. We can clean, reshape, and explore. We don't have to do this even for these samples because we only have nine times of experiment, six times of water, no missing data, everything's great. We have the data. And then now we could do some modeling. And then this part I will explain later. Let's just move on to um, the example. So again, the first step, as I mentioned, you might want to ask yourself, what might, it, what might be the data story? So data story, in other words, that means how do you think the data is generated? So think about it for a second. So there is a globe. And then on the surface of the globe, there are only two types of outcome, water and land, water, land, water, land, okay? You throw, you catch, you throw, you catch. You get either water or land under your index finger. And how this event, how this outcome, how this data can be generated. So this is the data story. Assume that so there is a true proportion of water covering the entire globe. We are interested in that number. 
this is the question that we have in the first place, we don't know it yet. But it's there, assume this is true. There's something true, but we just don't know. And uh, a single toss, a single catch, uh, throw catch, throw catch, a single one, a single experiment has a probability of theta of producing a water and uh, uh, one minus theta of producing a land, right? So if you have a true theta, each flow of a throw and catch will follow the theta and the one minus theta to get the event. So this is the data generation part, how the data might be generated, generated following the theta and the one minus theta. This I mentioned, one minus theta. And each of the toes of the globe is also independent of the others. So that means each data point is independent. That also means the outcome of the first throw and catch doesn't affect the second. So if I get a water for the first time, first experiment, the second time, if I also get a water is not really related to the first time. So then they are independent, okay? Good, so those are like the assumptions of the possible data story. So the key line here is actually the second and the third, well, maybe also including the first. So assuming there's a true parameter, it produces data. It's, it's the data generating process. It generates water land, water land according to a theta. We don't know. It's according to a theta for water and it, it's, uh, it's according to one minus theta for, for the land, okay? And uh, if you just go to some um, statistical consultant, for example, you show them the question that you have, you have water land example, you have theta and the one minus, this, one minus theta that you come up with. So you tell the statistician, you say, well, I have a data idea. I have a true theta, theta producing water, one minus theta producing land, how can I analyze it? And then the statistician maybe say that, okay, this is a perfect example that follows something called a binomial distribution. So here we will then be talking about the likelihood of a binomial distribution, okay? Um, here, this is the Bayes theorem. And uh, in the green color, this is the likelihood, we spend the time. And I said again, so modeling is to find the proper likelihood function that tries to link the data to the parameter. And here, because we are interested in a concrete example of likelihood, we move to just a concrete example of a binomial distribution or binomial likelihood function. So the binomial, fun a binomial linking function that looks like this, it is not a generic form of P data and then the theta. It is more detailed in the sense that the W is the number of water observation, in our case, six. The capital N is the total number of experiments, in our case, nine. And then the theta is the unknown parameter here, the theta, so the unknown parameter. So what we are asking here is that given the total number of sample, and then given there is the theta, and then we are looking at something like here, okay, the W. And then the actual interpretation is like the opposite. So I warn you, this is a likelihood, meaning W and N, they are fixed. And we are interested in here, the theta. But actually, but, but, but anyway, uh, the calculation for this binomial function, it is always like this. So here there's this term, then the theta, and then the minus theta. The details that doesn't really matter here because we can f uh, calculate the, uh, the exact numbers from R from different uh, softwares. But if you are indeed interested in how this is derived, go to Wikipedia, there is quite detailed explanation. And then in fact, the binomial distribution is really one of the most important one in the uh, history of the statistics and also economics. It goes back to like the Bernoulli family from, uh, from Switzerland. So very, very interesting, more than a few, three, four hundred years already. <laughs> Great. Yeah, this meaning I told you, capital N, total, total number of experiments, W, total number of water observation. The theta is the, like the true covering, water covering globe um, proportion that we're interested in. Okay, known and unknown. 
So how does the update work? <clears throat> From the steps that I told you, first step, get a data generation generating story, we have it. Second, use the data generation story and use the model and then see how the observed data could change our prior knowledge. And then it becomes the posterior knowledge. Okay, this is the update. So I told you that there are three types of priors, uninformative, weakly informative, and strongly informative. So here we will use a simpler one. And to start with, we will start with a uninformative prior, which is this dashed line, meaning the probability of getting 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 1.0, they are the same. So flat, flat prior, really boring, but flat prior, okay? Before we see any data, we have no idea. There is a globe and we don't know, just everything is possible. And then we do the first experiment, we throw, we catch, we get a water uh, observation. And then the line, the prior, after this data then becomes the posterior. So it changes and towards the direction of one. Makes sense? Because after one observation, and if only one, we could say, well, 100%. Even that makes sense, but it, that's how it updates. And then th that's also the reason why we need multiple trials to get a much precise estimation. Okay, second, um, you see here the pre previous posterior now becomes the prior of the current one. And then this prior is updated to another posterior given the second data point. So after observing another data point, the prior is updated to be like this. The interpretation is that if we only do twice of the experiment, we get water land, well, 50%. And then here you see around 50, this is the peak, okay? Similar idea, the previous posterior now becomes the current prior. And then this prior is updated using a newly observing data, then becomes another posterior, okay? Because here twice of water and uh, once of land, it is shifted a little bit towards 1.0, <clears throat> okay? Because we have nine times of experiments, we can do this updates, uh, step by step, and eventually we will see this black solid curve, <clears throat> okay? This is the black solid curve. After observing the entire sequence of experiments, okay? And then you might ask, well, for example, if the order is changing, if for example, I have six times of water consecutively, from the beginning, and then three times of land for the remaining. Do we still see the same curve? The answer is yes. So the order doesn't matter. So what might be changing is everything in the middle. In the middle, it changes, but the final step, it, it, it is the same. So it doesn't matter the order. And um, we also see, well, perhaps we are interested in the peak, the top of the curve. So this one, this is indeed two over three or six over nine. So now in this case, the Bayesian statistics and the frequentist statistics, they have one agreement, which is okay, which is good in fact, in this case. In the later you will see maybe they have some differences or disagreements. Mm -hmm. But for illustration reasons, I will show you easier examples where they are the same. And uh, so what you don't get from frequentist analysis or frequentist statistics is that you do not know the numbers of the other values, the probability of the other values. So what I'm trying to say is, if we are doing frequentist analysis, we only get this point, two over six or six over nine. But if we are doing the Bayesian statistics, statistics what we obtain instead is not a single number anymore in the literature, they are called point estimate. We are not doing a point estimate anymore. We get entire curve. So the entire curve, it is the posterior distribution of the theta. And then this distribution, first of all, 
it is a PDF of a parameter. So this is the probability density function. The area under the curve, it is one for, uh, to begin with. And secondly, the y-axis doesn't really make too much sense. They mean the relative probability as we illustrated the last time. They don't really mean too much about the probability. It means the relative probability. High is high, low is low is okay, but then the number you want to interpret doesn't make sense, okay? Thirdly, because this is a line, we can, besides the top, the peak, we can also interpret the others. So this is why I say the others are not ruled out, which is because, well, we know the peak is here, but it can also be here and here. So to be more uh, concrete, what I mean is that if let's say we have this sequence of data, water land, water land, water land, okay, water land, and uh, we have this observation and we want to infer from the data, the posterior, what is the possible unknown theta given this uh, data sequence? We know that two over three is the most likely one. So here, here, top, but the others, they are also likely, just like, less likely. In other words, if you have a true, supposedly, if you have a true theta of 0.5, can you still get this sequence? I guess, yes, right? I guess the answer is you might just think about it, but the answer is yes. If you have a true theta of 0.5, you could still possibly get this sequence. If you have a true, true theta of 0.9, you could still possibly get this sequence, but the relative possibility to get this sequence from 0.5 is smaller than 0 0.6667, 2 over 3. So this is the interpretation. You get a line here, and then you get the meaning of every single point on the curve. And then if you jointly interpret those numbers that I told you, they actually mean the uncertainty. So this is the very important idea of Bayesian statistics relative to frequency statistics is that you get the uncertainty of your parameter estimation. In another example, it's like, for example, we, instead of running this experiment nine times, we run 900, we run 900. Assuming we observe water 600 times, the proportion is the same, 600 times and 300 times of land. If we are calculating frequencies, uh, the frequency, we do the same, 600 over 900, two thirds, the same as here. But in, if you instead do a Bayesian statistics, the peak is still around here, but the line, the curve will be much narrower relative to when we do nine times of experiments, 900 versus nine and then you get a much higher confidence or less uncertainty about your parameter estimation. So this is the, uh, the different thing that you could obtain from the Bayesian statistics that is otherwise not available from frequency analysis, okay? Does that make sense? So there's the question asking why it's called frequency statistics. It is to calculate frequency in the beginning, like six times, a uh, six times of water out of nine. So that's the frequency. So what I'm trying the uncertain part, um, does that make sense? If you do 900 uh, instead of nine, you get 600 of water, 300 land. So the peak must be the same, but the, the width is very different. So in the 900 case, it will be so much narrower than the case of nine times of experiments. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so the y-axis, there's a question asking what is the interpretation of the y-axis? Um, so I said that here, this entire curve, this is a PDF. The area under the curve is one and then the y-axis, that's the relative probability. So the relative probability of the theta being 0.67 is larger than the relative probability of the theta being 0.5. So the relative probability. 
So recall the cake example. So let's say if we want to maintain the volume of the, the cake the same, so the, the area, when the area is large, then the cake is short. When the area is small, then the cake is uh, taller, tall. And then another question is the uncertainty outside the curve, inside the density. Well, uh, I don't understand the question. The, uh, the uncertainty is captured by the width or the variance uh, of the No, of I the can curve. repeat the, the question. You said that uh, it gives us the cert how certain some events are. Mm -hmm. So my question is other way around. Uh, mm -hmm. Where is the uncertainty? Where I see it on the graph? What I, because you said that- Here. This is an uncertainty. This is a larger uncertainty. Ah, if you say okay. 600. Now I get it. Right? Yeah. And then you get a narrower, and then you have a smaller uncertainty. Okay, if, you, if you draw a line only here, then one case, the uncertainty is this. The other one, the uncertainty is this. Yeah, I got it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Illustrative, not so precise, but you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. OK, good. And so the confidence or the relative probability increases with the amount of the data, yes. Which will narrow the curve, yes. Great points, yes. And another one, but isn't the uncertainty also included the frequencies approach by confidence intervals, since kind of similar to the width of the curve and behave similar in, in relation to sample size? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, this is a really good point. And uh, the difference can be explained here in this way. I'll try, I'm not really sure. So in frequencies analysis, the confidence interval, right? You, you have a confidence interval. So what is that? So the basic assumption is that in frequencies analysis, there is indeed a true, a true parameter in this case. Yeah, there is a true one. And then there is a, the associated 95 confidence interval. So if you do this 1,000 times, right? But in the, the Bayesian statistics, so the actual, the actual assumption is that you don't know the true one. You don't know the true one. So everything on this line can be the true parameter. It can be, it can be the true parameter. So what you are analyzing instead is that you get here this curve. You get this curve. So you get the for each parameter here, what is the relative probability of that theta? And then for this point, what is the relative probability of this point? So everything is true. Everything can be true, and you don't know which is true, but you could quantify the uncertainty or the relative probability of these parameter, of each parameter. So this is, in fact, one of the key difference to keep in short. So one assumes there is a true parameter in frequencies analysis, where here it doesn't assume there is a true parameter, which where, uh, where, uh, where in every parameter can be true, but you are quantified the relative probability. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, good. Some other questions. Will the PDF always be unimodal when updated? It depends on your prayer. So if your prayer is unimodal and um, depends, well, it depends on your prayer, depends on your likelihood. It can be unimodal, can be multi bimodal, uh, three modal, the trail tri modal. Yeah, doesn't have to be multi or unimodal. Um, some other questions. So the true parameter is one point on a curve, whereas the confidence interval is part of the curve. I don't think I understand the question. Could you elaborate, Lance? Yeah, sorry, my audio was off. So, um, so we're looking for the true parameter, which can which would be then in that case one single point on the curve because I know it would it would not be because it's so 
the curve is only the oh yeah sorry so um the x-axis is uh the, the part of so how much water we have and how much land right mm -hmm. so we so the real parameter is actually one single point on the curve isn't mm -hmm. it because yeah uh, yeah, confidence yeah intervals would be like yeah an amount of so points you are now talking about this frequencies analysis frequencies yeah this, this, okay yeah, if you are talking about frequency statistics, then there is the, the assumption is that there is a true parameter, and then you are quantifying these uh, uncertain c c confidence interval. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then there is one more question: What is the stop point of updating the model? It depends on how many data points you have. So if you have Mouse cursor. Uh, I don't. I don't know. I can't find it. So here I stopped after nine times of update. But if you do the experiment ten times, you do it one more time. If you have the data from twenty trials, you do it twenty trials twenty times. That makes sense. Yeah. So if you have here one more data, then you just update more. How narrow the the curve should be? I have no idea. So. so <laughs> after the data, all the data is included, then the posterior, how narrow it is, then it is how narrow it is. No, I'm sorry, you, uh, I will try to, 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 to make my question a bit different. Mm. I mean, is there is an objective rule when I should stop pre, uh, assuming that I have enough money to run the experiment and update the model as much as I want? Is there no, something objective? No, no, on, no, no, okay. no, 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 I don't think so. So why, so I let maybe uh, two, two more minutes because we are a little bit over time. You, you will get 15 minutes break, I, I guarantee that. Um, so let me try to answer that this way. So suppose that, so this curve we keep, okay? So we have this curve. <clears throat> and then we run another example, separate experiment. Let's say we have not too many, just 20 times of experiment. And we have the same um, uh, uh, proportion. So then it will become like, well, it's 20 doesn't work. 18, okay, 18, 18 times of experiment. And then out of that, we have 12 water. Okay, same proportion. And then we get another curve, which is a little bit narrow or taller also. Okay, something like this. The drawing is really bad, but just you get what I mean. Good. So what you can do, let's say 0.5 here. So what you can do here is you could calculate the area under the curve of the theta being larger than 0.5. So supposedly this one, it, this area under the curve is larger than this area under the curve. So this one's larger, this one's smaller, okay? These numbers, you can compare, honestly, you can compare. So then you don't really need a ob objective measurement. You can just say after these times of experiment, I could quantify that the probability of the parameter being above 0.5, meaning the proportion of water covering the land is more than half more than more than 50% is larger than this. And you can already use the number to, to, to draw your conclusion. And then you don't really need a so-called uh, objective criteria to draw this conclusion. You don't need, yeah, make sense? Okay. okay I guess you do. <laughs> so perfect. Uh, last slides before we go to the break. So this is easier. So here, if we focus on the likelihood part, they are the same. And then what I'm showing you is the power of prior. This is a uniform prior. This is whatever shape. And then this is another prior, okay? And uh, the prior will influence or impact the shape of the posterior. So the prior and the likelihood, the product, you get the posterior. 
So when it is uniform, the shape are the same, likelihood and posterior. When the prayer is like this, very strange, then the posterior will be reflected also this way. And then when here, this prayer is like a sharp, whatever, then the posterior will also be reflected in this way. So back to the other question, if you have something like a this bimodal prayer, and then I don't know how it will even look like, something like this perhaps. So it doesn't have to be unimodal. So it can be bi, trimodal, multimodal distribution. All right. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Makes sense? Everything's okay? Great. I'm sorry this takes longer, but I guess we could have a break and then let's be back in 15 minutes at five o'clock five sharp, all right? Good. Then see you in a bit. <laughs> 